So uh, last week we talked about policy instruments. Um, I said that originally there was a three week schedule on policy instruments. Uh, but I, uh, but because of the reading week, um, that got shortened to two weeks. Uh, what I decided experimentally um, at the last minute as well is to fold a lot of next week's material into uh, this week. Um, and that of course implies then that part of this week uh, will be uh, dropped. But there is a, a pre-record uh, of this um, and also it will be eventually in my lecture notes. Uh, so that is the plan for today, a slight change of plan. Uh, and therefore also the slides that you may have downloaded yesterday are different, slightly different from the ones uh, that I'm going to show today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, market-based instruments, uh, taxes, subsidies, uh, tradable permits, and hopefully towards the end I'm going to talk about market power and monitoring and enforcement. Um, <clears throat> this is where we are in the sequence, I just told you this. Um, next week is the reading week. Uh, I'm going to start talking about environmental taxes. We already talked about the PIGU tax. Now I'm going to talk more generally about environmental taxes. I'm going to illustrate this with uh, the plastic bag levy in Ireland. So environmental tax is essentially a charge or a levy or a penalty or a fee the word, the exact word that you use depends on the jurisdiction that you're in and the exact nature uh, of the tax um, as well as on political uh, considerations. In some countries you cannot use the word penalty, in other countries you cannot use the word fee and yet other countries uh, if you use the word tax then people start yelling at you. Uh, so there's all sort of euphemisms there as well as legal distinctions on what it really is. Um, and that tax or fee or charge or penalty or levy um, is put on every unit emitted, preferably because we're interested in reducing emissions, uh, but sometimes it is levied on uh, production or consumption of the offending uh, material. Uh, <coughs> and that works as follows. Um, so here we have the cost-benefit uh, diagram uh, that we looked at before. In brown you're looking at the marginal private gains from not the emissions but from the economic activity that causes the emissions. And then when there's no regulation we would go to the point where the private gains equal uh, the marginal private gains equal zero because at that point we don't want to use more energy or we don't want to drive our car more uh, or uh, we're done eating beef um, we are simply satiated uh, at this point or perhaps uh, if the costs are substantial uh, the additional expense does not justify the additional benefit to the polluter right uh, so Q prime is the unregulated amount of emissions. Uh, <coughs> then in green, we're looking at the marginal externality, the marginal social losses uh, from those emissions. Uh, and then we said, well, the optimum amount is Q star, where the marginal costs equal the marginal benefits. We've been over this graph. Now what happens if you levy a tax emission gets more expensive. That's the nature of a tax, right? So the marginal private gains from the emitting activity fall, right? From the dark brown to the light brown. And as a result, emissions go from Q prime to Q double prime, right? We simply make it more expensive to do the offending thing. We also talked about the PIGU tax. Um, and that is that tax that exactly internalizes the externality. Uh, so if we levy a tax that brings us exactly to Q star, that is the PIGU tax, right? 
This thing here is just an environmental tax in dark orange. In light orange, we're looking at the uh, Pigou tax. And the, le the level of the Pigou tax is exactly this amount, right? It is the marginal cost of the externality at the optimum. That is the Pigou tax, right? Um, <coughs> so that is how a tax works. Um, I can't tell you a whole lot more about this because it's as simple as this. Um, so let's look at one particular uh, example, uh, and that is the plastic bag levy in Ireland uh, that has been uh, called uh, the most popular tax in Europe, knowing, of course, that taxes are rarely uh, popular. Uh, and this is a, a, a 15 euro cents levy uh, that was introduced per bag um, in Ireland. And this was introduced against uh, the will of the people. What you're looking at um, in table one is the results of a survey that was done among the Irish uh, population or the people uh, resident in Ireland, how much they would be willing to pay for a plastic bag at the checkout in uh, the supermarket. Um, and 40%, as you see, was not prepared to pay anything. And uh, then a, a small majority was prepared to pay something, um, but not a whole lot, uh, up to the highest uh, that they went in the survey. Yeah, it was seven and a half um, cents per bag. Government nonetheless introduced this tax and doubled it to the maximum amount that you see here. Uh, the reason for this um, is uh, politics, uh, because the Minister for the Environment at the time was not a great fan, friend of the environment, uh, but he was a great friend of his department. And the way this is done is that the proceeds, the revenue of the levy, go to the departmental budget rather than to the treasury. So this was the minister's own money, essentially. Uh, and this was a guy who was power hungry and wanted to have funds that do not depend on a fight with uh, the Ministry uh, for Finance. Uh, so that is why he pushed this through and he set it at uh, 15 uh, cents. <coughs> um, <coughs> the annual revenue, it's not a large sum of money, uh, is uh, 13 million. Um, the levy, introducing the levy, uh, because previously plastic bags were just given away for free and were not counted, uh, so they needed to set up a computing system and a reporting system and a monitoring system that cost 1.2 million. Um, they also, uh, at the beginning, had an awareness campaign, uh, ads on telly explaining why uh, this was done and how bad it is for the environment to use plastic bags because they end up uh, people throw them away and then they get blown around and you see them everywhere in the countryside and in the cities uh, or they end up in landfill and they emit methane and uh, that changes the climate uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was not a very convincing argument, it was more convincing that these things ended up in head throws and then deer would eat them and choke and that sort of stuff, that is what really got people going. Um, and then there's an annual variable cost, it's essentially the monitoring system, uh, which is uh, 3,000, uh, 350,000. Uh, <clears throat> so this is good, right? For from the perspective of the government, uh, the benefits uh, clearly exceeds uh, the costs. Um, they did need to set up this system because it was something that was not reported before, but it is essentially an excise, right? An excise is a tax that is proportional to the volume of things, right? An excise is proportional to the volume of alcohol, for instance, uh, or the volume of cigarettes. Uh, that is an excise, and in this case it's proportional to the volume. It's other than a VAT, a value added tax, which is proportional to the value of something, right? This is a volume. Um, so it could be easily integrated into the system of collecting excises and VAT. That's why the costs uh, are so low. Uh, <clears throat> it's also good for um, the uh, environment, 
uh, areas with no plastic litter increased by 21%. So they do this annual survey where they count plastic bags floating around in the environment. Um, and they found uh, substantial decreases. Little litter uh, increased by 56%. Um, they also regularly survey how much plastic is in the waste uh, stream. It's a wonderful job if you're uh, interested. Um, there's actually people who go and inspect waste, um, right? Um, that fell uh, substantially from 5% of the total waste volume to uh, one-fifth of a percent. Uh, retailers were pretty happy too um, because people started bringing their own bags which actually is a reduction in costs for the supermarkets because they don't have to provide those bags and they don't have to hire somebody and that's of course at your expense uh, i don't have to hire people to uh, bring the bags to the counter um, and to the shops um, and the public uh, was pretty happy too the table one that i showed you people were particularly unhappy right they did not want this before it was introduced uh, but after uh, it was introduced, uh, people were either neutral or positive on what happened at the checkout, right? All sorts of fears, oh my god, how am I going to bring my shopping home? Uh, that turned out to be not a problem. Uh, no issues with convenience, no issues with expense, because you could easily substitute your plastic bag for either a paper bag or for a long-lived bag, right? Um, and people were particularly impressed with the environmental impact of it all, right? Uh, so that's why this is the most popular uh, tax in uh, Europe. Um, the credit always goes to Ireland, which is not fair because Denmark actually did this first. Uh, but Ireland has a more active uh, environmental uh, economics community, so they uh, blew their trumpet um, much more um, loudly than the Danes did. Um, and this, of course, has now also been introduced into the United Kingdom. Wales uh, was first. Uh, with a 5p uh, levy uh, in 2010 and as a result in Wales plastic bag use fell by 71 percent if you're talking about single use and uh, 57 percent overall because most of the switch was to uh, paper um, <coughs> so this is quite an it's, it's a very small fee right 5p for a bag that's nothing uh, but people so hate paying for this so hate paying for stuff and uh, and there's a very easy substitute in the terms of prominent uh, permanent bags in terms of uh, paper bags that you just see a complete switch right the alternative is cheaper much cheaper than uh, the offending uh, activity uh, <coughs> the rules in uh, the UK are a little bit uh, different than in Ireland the reason that, as I said, the reason that this tax was introduced in Ireland because the minister wanted his own slush funds. In the UK, the money actually goes to charity. Um, essentially, the supermarkets and other shops collect this tax on behalf of the government. And then they are under a, an agreement where they donate this money to charity rather than uh, added to their profits. Um, it's a bit unclear whether this really happens. So for the first two years after the plastic bag levy was introduced in Wales and later in Scotland and later still in England, there were newspaper reports, yes, they, Tesco did give this money to charity. But since, it's been quiet. Right? There's actually nobody who's really looking into this anymore. So we assume that these companies are still playing by the rules, but we actually do not know that for certain. Uh, <coughs> but um, as I said, this has been introduced, has been rolled out um, throughout uh, the United uh, Kingdom, and it's very successful. And the reason is very simple. You make something more expensive, the alternative all of a sudden becomes much more attractive and people switch en masse to the alternative. Um, so taxes work. Um, <coughs> what about subsidies? Um, a subsidy is essentially a negative tax. So instead of paying money to the government for every 
ton of something emitted, you get money from the government, it's a subsidy, and you get it for doing something good, um, that is for every unit, for every ton not emitted. Um, and then the question is, how are taxes and subsidies uh, different? Well, at the margin, nothing changes. Um, so I showed you this diagram. Um, so this is the marginal uh, damages to the environment. This is the private gains before uh, regulation at the margin. And then if you levy a tax, you have to pay for your emissions. So your costs increase. Uh, and therefore you do less of the offending activity and you go from Q prime to Q double prime. Now what happens if you get money for not emitting? Uh, nothing, right? Now you can earn money from not emitting and that essentially means that the cost of emissions fall because instead of paying a tax, if you emit more, you forego a subsidy if you emit more. Right? And note the double negative. So a subsidy is a negative tax, but instead of paying it, you're foregoing a payment. Right? So there's a double negative here. So at the margin, the effects of taxes and subsidies are the same. Right? Is that clear? That the key thing here is the double negative, right? If you emit more, you don't get a subsidy. If you emit more, you pay the tax. Right? Or if you emit less, you get the subsidy. If you emit less, you forego paying the tax. Right? double negative in either direction. Um, <clears throat> so taxes and subsidies have the same effect on emissions in the short run. Do they also have the same effect in the long run? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, and in order to answer questions about the long run, we don't need to look, we should not look at the marginal gains but we should look at the average uh, private gains. Uh, so I showed you this graph before. This is the total private gains from emissions, which goes zero here. At some point, we're uh, fed up with doing the uh, offending stuff. Uh, this is the slope of the solid curve, which goes through zero at Q prime. Lo and behold, that's also where this graph uh, reaches its maximum. Now, if we, uh, I needed to press only once, uh, if we, um, okay, uh, so this is the marginal cost curve, uh, the dotted one here is the average uh, cost curve, right? This is per unit of emissions. Uh, and this is just uh, the shape uh, that you have there. Uh, if you start at zero, then average and marginal are the same, but of course later on they deviate from each other. Now, if we introduce a tax, then what happens is that your average costs increase, and therefore your average benefits fall, because you're paying money to the government, right? So your costs go up, your benefits go down. If you get a subsidy, your costs fall and your profits increase because now you're getting money from the government, right? And so the marginal costs move in the same direction because of whether it's a subsidy or a tax but your average costs move in opposite direction. Now, what does that imply? Usually I get a preview of the next slide, but not today, for some reason. Um, computers. 
right? Um, what does that imply? It attacks your average profits fall and therefore your return on investment goes down and therefore it is less attractive to invest in this industry and therefore you have a negative growth effect. With a subsidy your average costs fall and therefore your average profits increase and therefore the rate of uh, return on your investment increases and you invest more in the polluting activity. Right? So a tax cuts emissions statically in the short run and shrinks the sector, the polluting sector in the long run. A subsidy reduces emissions in the short run but grows the offending sector in the long run. Right? So taxes and subsidies work the same way in the short run but have the opposite effect in the long run. Right? Um, <clears throat> plus, of course, taxes and subsidies have different effects on the budget because in the case of a tax, money flows from industry to government. In case of subs uh, subsidy, money flows from government to industry. Right? So taxes and subsidies are only identical if you're looking at the short run effect on emissions, but they are different in other ways. So, <clears throat> let's turn to chapter 3, uh, tradable permits. Tradable permits uh, work uh, as follows. Um, <clears throat> It starts by the government setting an overall target, preferably on emissions, um, but it can also be a target on production or consumption. And uh, let's consider sulfur and let's say that the government sets an overall target of 100 million tons of sulfur emitted per year. Then the next step is that this overall target is split into company targets or facility targets where every company that is active in this market, and sulfur comes out of uh, electricity produ uh, production, say there's 10 companies that do this, every company gets at an allocation of 10 million tons of sulfur. <coughs> so far this is direct regulation, right? The government simply sets a standard or a target for every company uh, that is active in the market and how much they can emit. So this is direct regulation. <clears throat> but uh, then uh, the market uh, kicks in and if a company thinks it has too many permits, it thinks it can reduce emissions by more than what it is uh, allowed to, it can bring its emissions down below its target, then it can sell those permits two companies think they have too few of these permits. At this point the government steps back and says you sort it out for yourself, I gave you your target, if you want to swap your targets or part of your targets, that's up to you. Right? So that is how tradable permits uh, work. Um, <coughs> so let's uh, suppose uh, there's two firms um, <coughs> So on the vertical axis we have the marginal cost of emission reduction, on the horizontal axis we have emission reduction itself, um, <coughs> and then uh, we have two firms and in firm one, which for some reason is denoted in green, um, um, it is fairly expensive to reduce emissions and at the margin and in firm 2, denoted in red, it is much cheaper to reduce its emissions. But initially they both get the same standard and that same standard is Q and Q is equal uh, for both companies, Q1 is equal to Q2. 
And that means that one company pays at the margin P2 and the other company pays at the margin P1, right? So we give the same standard to both companies and one has to pay more than the other. <coughs> now, how does uh, the tradable permit aspect then kick in? Essentially, what company one can say to company two is, I reduce my emissions by a little bit less, I emit a little bit more, I give you money, and then you make up the difference. So company one, company one moves to the right, and company two moves to the left, um, until the price is equal, right? And the key thing here is that uh, the right mo rightward movement of one company is the same in volume of emissions as the leftward movement of the other company until the price is equal, right? That is how tradable permits work. And then as a result, both pay the same at the margin. And that is, of course, the condition for uh, cost effectiveness that we talked about last week, right? That is how tradable permits work. If there's two companies, if there's many companies, then of course this graph gets a whole lot more complicated, but the principle is the same. Companies with high emission reduction costs buy permits on the market and companies with low emission reduction costs sell permits at the market. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'll get back to uh, the bottom uh, bullet point. If that market works well, if tr the, the market for tradable permits works well, or actually if it's perfect, then everybody pays the same price, right? You have a uniform price because it's a uniform product, um, and that uh, guarantees cost effectiveness, and I'll get back to that later. Uh, so how does this work uh, in practice, and does it work in practice? The first large-scale permit market was uh, introduced in 1990 in the United States, uh, and it was uh, a market for sulfur uh, emissions. And we are in the US, so sulfur is spelled with an F. Um, <coughs> initially, the market was limited to um, 263 power generators. By now, it's much more. Uh, but those 263 were the, actually a fair market share. They covered uh, about 22% uh, of the thermal energy that went into power generation. Uh, and around 17% uh, of the capacity for power generation. So this was a fair chunk of the electricity market. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, that was in 1995. Later, after uh, 2000, uh, the market extended to many more uh, activities. Importantly, if you're going to trade in sulfur emission permits, you need to know your sulfur emissions. You cannot trade in something that you cannot measure, right? Um, and this is an important uh, consideration. This actually adds uh, substantially to the cost. The $124,000 uh, need to be put on your smokestacks in order to measure how much sulfur is really coming out. Um, <coughs> So all of the 263 got their initial allocation, uh, and then they can trade freely amongst uh, one another. And actually, anybody could buy permits, uh, only those 200, and anybody could sell permits, uh, but only those 263 got an initial allocation. Anybody could register on this market and buy permits and do with it whatever. Uh, buy them as a speculative investment, um, which I'll show you was a bad idea. 
or as a whole bunch of my colleagues did, buy them and then show them to class. Look, I got a permit, they are real. Um, which is how uh, some uh, permits got retired, right? Uh, because those permits were never used against emissions. Essentially, the way this works is that at the end of the fiscal year, these 263 companies need to show A, their emission record, this is how much sulfur they emitted, and needed to show how many permits they had, right? And if you emitted 100 million tons of CO2, well, that's a bit much. If you emitted 1 million tons of CO2, then you needed to surrender 1 million permits for emitting this, right? And then they're gone. And if you did not have sufficient permits for your emissions, then there's a large fine on your company, as well as a criminal record for your company, right? Uh, and U.S. companies are, ex not, they're not so much worried about the fine, but they are very worried about building up a criminal record because then of later lawsuits, that gets really, really painful, right? There's a big difference between the U.S. and uh, European legal systems in that uh, regard. <coughs> the other thing uh, that companies could do is bank those permits. So the permits have a date, but that is a date of issue. It does not have a date of expiry. So if you buy, if you bought a permit in 1996, you could use that against emissions in 1996, in 1997, all the way up to 2021 or in the future. That is called banking of permits. There is no borrowing of permits. You cannot say, well, I emitted uh, sulfur in 1995 and I promise to buy permits for this in 1996. That doesn't work, right? So you can bring these permits to the future, but you can't bring future permits to today, right? So <coughs> time flows uh, in one direction in this market. So what happened uh, in this market? Um, <coughs> well, uh, there's four lines on this graph, and I understand three of those. Um, this line here, the dotted line, it, well, let's start with this. These are the actual sulfur emissions. This is what they reckon emissions would have been. Uh, and actually, it, as I said, the market started in 1995. It was announced, uh, announced in 1990. And what you see is there appears to be an anticipation effect, right? Regulation was passed into law, and companies immediately started, started cutting their emissions. Uh, so there is an anticipation effect. Um, there's no reward for this, but because of the sluggishness and the long-lived capital in the power generation sector, it sort of makes sense to prepare before regulations hit. <coughs> um, then this line here was the actual mandated amount of emissions. And what you see is that in the first two years, companies overcomplied. It was apparently much easier to cut emissions than the Environmental Protection Agency had anticipated. Um, <coughs> so that is uh, the first thing we see. Um, <coughs> this is um, slightly more complicated. On the horizontal axis, you're looking at all of the uh, trading units for which there are records. <coughs> and what I don't understand at the moment is why we go up to more than 400, right? Because I said there was only 263. Um, <coughs> on uh, the vertical axis is how much SO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, was emitted per not per kilowatt hour or uh, megawatt hour, uh, but million British thermal units. For some reason, uh, Americans count energy in British thermal units. Uh, that is what it stands for, or essentially kilowatt hour. <coughs> if you convert it, right, it's not the same, of course. Uh, but that's how you uh, want to think about it. Uh, then the 
black line, the very thick line, is how much they were allowed to emit. This is their initial allocation of uh, permits. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, the dotted lines that you see here are their actual, uh, their actual emissions. And what you see is that the, the, the companies that are above the thick line emitted more than they were initially allowed. So these are the guys that bought permits. Uh, and then at the, the guys that are below the line are the ones that sold uh, their permits, right? Um, so there was a fairly active trade. Uh, these are the prices. Um, so trading actually started three years before the market really started, so these were futures. And the market uh, started uh, fairly high, around 300. Uh, and then here is where the trading actually started and the price sort of dropped first to 150 and then to well below uh, that. So just like there was overcompliance, it suggests that it was much cheaper to do this than anticipated. The same is true for the price development. That people expected that this would cost, initially expected that this would cost uh, 300. Uh, dollars per ton, but actually it turned out it cost 150 or less. So, and there were of course also industry reports, uh, including written by some fairly famous economists that actually predicted that this would cost a thousand dollars per ton. But all those predictions were way off. Um, <coughs> So that is uh, the second uh, thing that we see. Uh, <coughs> part of this was lobbying, and part of it was technology pessimism in the models that predicted these prices. Simply the engineers and the economists who built these models did not quite count on the ingenuity of the people who actually run power plants and their ability to reduce emissions. Uh, <coughs> I'm not convinced that there's a wider lesson here, because uh, what we see now in climate, where we have a very similar discussion, there seem to be a lot of technology optimism uh, in models. People sort of have learned from uh, the sulfur experience, they say our models are always off by a factor two, too high, so let's do the calculations and divide our numbers by two, and then we got it roughly right. I'm not convinced that that is the right way <coughs> to go about it, but in this case, there was definitely a lot of pessimism um, in the initial forecast. Um, and then uh, the most uh, intriguing thing uh, is what is going on here. Um, these are the uh, first three auctions of these uh, emissions. Um, so I, I did not say that actually. I sort of said, well, these emission permits went from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to the polluters, but I never told you how. Um, they were actually auctioned. There's many ways you can allocate initial permits. You can give them away for free uh, to your friends or to the whole population or something, or you can sell them in auction, right? Um, and that is what they did uh, in this particular case. The curves that you see displayed, and it's from an older paper before there were colors or good graphics, because um, this is old stuff by now. At this curve, so we have the quantity on the horizontal axis, we have the price on the vertical uh, axis. Uh, this is the um, demand curve, how much people are willing to pay to buy these permits, uh, and this is the supply curve. <coughs> So there was also a free allocation. It wasn't just an auction. There was permits were allocated for free, and then initially there was an auction between everybody, and people could put their allocated emissions uh, up for sale. So demand curve, supply curve. And what you see is that both have an incline. And then a year later, you see that the demand curve and the supply curve still have an incline but it is much steeper. And then in year three, in 1995, 
you see that both demand and supply curve are flat, right? One is horizontal, the other is vertical. Now, what does this mean, right? This means that in 1993, people were uncertain about the price. There was a lot of uncertainty about what the price would be, and different companies would have different demands and supplies. Come 1995, only two years later, everybody in the market knew what the price would be, right? And there was just no variation in the bids and the offers, right? That is what it means when your supply curve goes vertical and your demand curve goes horizontal. Everybody knows the price, um, <coughs> which is quite remarkable. Um, So initially a large spread in bids, which means that buyers were uncertain about the price and it disappeared in two years. The market was this fully transparent, every actor in the market was fully rational and fully informed, right, within two years. Uh, <coughs> that is how quickly people learn about markets. Uh, <coughs> Another uh, aspect of this is that in 1992 and in 1993, Consultants were making lots of money in this market because all these companies were very uncertain about how this market would work and what the price would be and oh my god, what am I going to do with my company and how am I going to cut emissions if I can't cut emissions, can I then buy enough additional permits and oh my god, what happens if I'm fined and get a criminal record, right? A lot of uncertainty, a lot of nervousness in these companies and as a result they called in expensive consultants who reassured them and helped them uh, with their plans. Uh, similarly, initially, a lot of the trade went through brokers because the companies themselves did not quite know how much to pay and how to buy and how uh, and this and that. And they called in intermediaries to solve these problems uh, for them. Within two years, all the consultants had moved on to different um, to different uh, pastures, same for the brokers, they went back to selling equity uh, and uh, bonds and what have you, they essentially left the tradable permit, uh, the, the, the sulfur market. <coughs> this again is a sign that information is now with the primary agents and you don't no longer need uh, intermediaries. Uh, same thing happened uh, much later with uh, the CO2 permit, CO2 emissions permit market. In the beginning, they were hiring hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of young guys and girls like you to work on the CO2 accounts of banks and uh, utilities and steel companies and oil companies. They were investing lots and lots of people, they were putting lots and lots of people on these things. Um, <coughs> then has also completely disappeared. Um, after Brexit, uh, before Brexit, London was the hub of the European system for emissions, uh, emission permits rate in CO2 and other greenhouse gases. That has disappeared from London and that cost only 300 jobs. <coughs> it's that market has also become completely uh, transparent. I used to advise students when they came, what sort of jobs should I get? And I always said, go <coughs> find a job in a CO2 brokerage because there's lots of money there. No longer, right? Uh, and the, the information is now in the primary agents in the market. We no longer need intermediaries. <coughs> now, this success story of sulfur permits um, much lower prices, over compliance, converts to a perfect market within two years, uh, <coughs> explains why permit systems, tradable permits, are now so very popular, right? <coughs> of course, it does not mean that what worked for sulfur in the US works for other stuff elsewhere, uh, but it explains the uh, success rate of this. <coughs> So, um, I'm halfway, um, which is good. That's where I hope to be. Um, 
two more chapters for this week and then I have time for next week. Um, <coughs> so how do taxes compare to tradable permits? You may think that taxes and trade permits are very similar, and they are in many ways. Um, both reduce emissions, right? With a tax, you make emissions more expensive, and therefore you reduce the quantity of emissions. Uh, with tradable permits, you restrict the quantity, and therefore a price pops up, <coughs> right? Uh, but both reduce emissions. Um, I'll get back. Uh, <laughs> to this point, uh, the second point uh, later. I'm a bit surprised by my uh, order of things. Um, with a tax, everybody pays the same tax. The marginal cost of emission reduction are equal to the tax, so everybody uh, has the same marginal emission reduction cost. Same is true for emission permits. Everybody faces the same price in the market, so everybody faces the same emission reduction cost at uh, the margin. Uh, and even the distributional consequences are the same. If there's a tax, then money flows from polluters to the government. If there's tradable permits and those permits are auctioned, then money flows from polluters to the government. Right? So tra taxes and tradable permits are very similar. Um, but there is a crucial distinction. Um, and that is that if you use a tax, then you have a good grip on the economic implications of what you're doing, because you know the marginal cost of emission reduction, because that is equal to your tax. You actually don't quite know how emissions will respond, right? That depends on your assumed price elasticity, which is an assumption, typically rather than something that we know, or is roughly estimated, rather than something that we know for certain. Um, <coughs> with tradable permits, it's the opposite. You know exactly what your emissions will be, because that is the overall cap that you set, but you don't know what the price will be, unless you know your price elasticity, which you typically do not. So there is a crucial distinction here between taxes and tradable permits. With taxes, you have cost certainty, but environmental uncertainty. Uh, with tradable permits, you have uh, quantity certainty, but cost uncertainty. Uh, and the question is, which of the two is worse? <coughs> Of course, if you have the ability to perfectly predict your economy, then taxes and tradable uh, permits are the same. But you are not, and the question is, which of the two are worse? And to answer that question, we need to look at the Weizmann theorem. And here we see uh, Marty, um, an older Marty than when he uh, wrote up the uh, Weizmann theorem. Okay, um, here comes our cost-benefit diagram again. Uh, so in brown, we have the marginal costs of emissions, right? And they go through zero, and that is the unregulated amount. Um, and we have the marginal damage curve uh, that is shaped like this. We have quantity on the horizontal axis. We have price on the vertical axis. And the optimum should pop up now. A is when marginal costs equal marginal benefits. And we either want to set a quantity Q star, that is our total cap on emissions in the optimum, or we want to set a tax <coughs> P star, that is our optimal tax, right? And if we know exactly where these two curves are, then we know what tax to set, and then the quantity will fall out, right? If we set a uh, tax P star, then quantity Q star will result. Or if we set quantity Q star, then P star will result, right? This is just a uh, Samuelsonian duality, right? Now, <coughs> Weizmann broke 
that duality and he did that as follows let's assume that the government does not know for sure the cost of emission reduction and let's assume that the government listens to the uh, industry lobbyists and these industry lobbyists have convinced that the marginal costs of emission reduction is not this brown line here but it is the red line that you see here so lobbyists have convinced the government that emission reduction really is more expensive than it really is right <coughs> so what happens then uh, the government still assumed to be a benevolent social planner so it sets quantity q prime um, no um, if it uses <coughs> emission uh, stop I should go back I should go back um, if it uses um, tradable permits right it sets quantity uh, q prime that is it gives in to the lobbyists it allows for more emissions than it otherwise would have had right because q prime is larger than q star and this is emissions that we have on this axis if it uses a tax instrument um, uh, my arrow down button doesn't work properly um, then it sets the tax P prime right it is higher than P star so my interpretation that the government gave in to the industry lobbyists doesn't work right <coughs> because now we have over regulation the price the tax is higher than it should have been in the optimum so it's listening to Greenpeace rather than to uh, Axon right so the uh, duality is broken right if there is a mistake in what the true marginal costs are then with a price instrument you over regulate and with a quantity instrument you under regulate so taxes and tradable permits are no longer the same now what are the welfare implications of this well the welfare loss of under regulation is this blue triangle here right so we have under regulation so we save this amount in emission reduction costs so that is a saving uh, but we suffer this amount in additional environmental damage and the difference is the blue triangle here that is the social welfare loss due to under regulation um, <coughs> if we use a tax instrument then we have over regulated which has this amount of costs for the polluters the additional cost for the polluters is the area here uh, but we also have additional environmental benefits that's the area under the green curve uh, and the welfare loss due to over regulation is the pink triangle now there's a clear distributional issue going on here right uh, you shift costs from the environment to the polluters or from the polluters to the environment uh, but from where you're sitting the pink triangle and the blue triangle look the same size right and this is not an optical illusion the pink triangle and the blue triangle are the same size but now what happens if the marginal damage cost curve is steeper than it was well in that case if you make the marginal damage curve uh, steeper ah. <laughs> then the blue triangle shrinks and the pink triangle grows and if you make it shallower <coughs> then the blue triangle grows and the pink triangle shrinks this is the Weizmann theorem um, <coughs> if the green curve and the brown curve have the same slope then the two welfare triangles are the same size but if they're not 
they are of different size. That is the Weizmann theorem. What does that say? Uh, if the marginal damage cost curve is less steep than the marginal abatement uh, cost curve, then mistakes with price instruments, taxes, are less costly than our mistakes with quantity instruments. But if the marginal damage cost curve is steeper, then this is reversed. Now, intuitively, um, what does this mean? With taxes, you buy cost certainty. So, and, and that is worth something, right? You know your, uh, the economic consequences, at least at the margin, for certain. And that brings a certain value to it. Um, <coughs> and in that case, uh, if that is important to you, and if you're talking about plastic bags, that's such small fry, essentially. I mean, I talked about three million, 13 million for the Irish economy, right, which is measured, uh, measured in billions. So that is very small, and it doesn't really matter if you get your plastic bag levy wrong, right? Uh, and that means that your brown curve here is fairly flat. But if you care deeply about uh, deer choking on plastic bags, then your uh, green curve is fairly uh, steep. And in that case, you say, well, I don't care much about the economic costs, but I do care about the environmental consequences. And if I get my environmental consequences wrong, then I suffer greatly. In that case, you go for tradable permits because you buy that environmental certainty with your tradable permits. If, on the other hand, you're talking about a problem like climatic change, yeah, what you do in Ireland with your emissions actually doesn't matter, or what you do in the UK with your emissions doesn't really matter because it's a global problem, it's a long-term problem. Also, what you do between this election and the next doesn't really matter because it's a long-term problem. So, we don't affect the climate really with our personal emissions, right? It's emissions accumulated over decades over the whole world, but what we ourselves do doesn't really matter. Uh, <coughs> so, your green curve is flat. course, as we now see in China, if you work too hard on your emission reduction, and what has happened in China, if you have not been paying attention, is they had fairly strict CO2 limits. So what they did, local authorities, the only way to uh, meet our CO2 limits is to close down coal-fired power plants. And as a result, they did not make electricity. And as a result, a whole bunch of uh, companies had to shut down because there was no electricity. That is extremely costly, right? If you shut down your economy uh, too fast or if you're looking uh, at the pictures of Insulate Britain. Um, if indeed you're going to reduce emissions by not being allowed to drive to work uh, or to school anymore, that is extremely costly and you can uh, see countless videos on YouTube of people getting very agitated uh, with insulate Britain blocking the roads, right? <coughs> so in those sort of cases, the costs are fairly steep. If you reduce emissions too fast, that is going to cost you. Uh, but because it's a long-term problem, it's a global problem, it doesn't really matter what you do with your emissions in 2021 in a small corner of the world, then your um, green curve is flat, your brown curve is steep, and in that case you would rather have the economic certainty of taxes over the environmental certainty of tradable permits. Right? That is uh, the Weizmann theorem, and uh, this was published in 1974 by this guy here, Marty Weizmann, who should have won the Nobel Prize. Um, <coughs> So, half an hour left. Um, so I'm going to run quickly uh, through this. Uh, I'm going to essentially skip everything apart from cost-effectiveness because people tend to struggle with that. Uh, so I've showed you 
this particular result last week that if we have a social planner, a benevolent social planner who wants to reduce emissions at the lowest possible cost <coughs> by minimizing the sum total of all emissions subject to some sort of emission target, so M is emission reduction and we want the collective emission reduction to be greater than or equal to our social target and we assume a quadratic or a second order polynomial for our costs then if this is uh, the optimization problem that we have we want to minimize the cost of emission reduction subject to meeting our target and we form the Lagrangian and we write down the first order condition for that Lagrangian and then what we find is that the marginal cost, the cost of emission reduction for every polluter N should equal the shadow price of the constraint lambda the price of the constraint pops up here and the crucial insight here was that this lambda does not have a subscript because it's a shared constraint right so this is our first order condition for cost effectiveness now what happens if we impose a tax there is the tax <coughs> our cost function changes this is the linear cost of emission reduction, this is the quadratic cost of emission reduction, so this is how much we reduce our emissions. But if we reduce our emissions, we pay less in tax, so our costs fall. And let's assume that the tax is equal to T, then this is how much we pay less in tax, so this is a cost saving, so we need to subtract this from our costs. It's um, unconstrained optimum we just impose a tax and then we see what companies would do so we want to minimize the costs we want to minimize the costs for each company N and each company decides for itself how much to reduce emissions but other than that there's no constraints uh, so the optimum is where the marginal cost the CDMN is equal to zero. The CDMN is uh, beta plus, I put a half here, uh, plus two times uh, one half is one, that's why the half is here, uh, plus gamma uh, <coughs> times m, and then we have the minus t here. And what you see is that the marginal costs of emission reduction equal t, the tax, and this is true for all companies, uh, all polluters n. So if we impose the same tax on every company, then we have this condition here. We have that the costs at the margin are equal for everybody. Right? The same is true if we have a subsidy S where the subsidy, now you're getting money, but the more emissions you, uh, the more you reduce your emissions, the higher the subsidy that you get. So if M, which is emission reduction, we call, is greater, your costs fall. Right? The difference between this equation and this equation is that here we have a tax T and here we have a subsidy S. Other than that, no, nothing changes. So your equilibrium condition is that your marginal cost equal S. And as long as everybody gets the same subsidy, you are cost effective, right? Um, <coughs> what happens if we have tradable permits? Well, if you're a permit buyer, that's essentially a a tax that you pay, right? But instead of paying the tax to the revenue, you're paying tax to uh, some other company, but it doesn't matter, your money is gone, right? Uh, so if you're an emission permit buyer, uh, this is what you do. For every unit of emissions, or every unit of emission reduction, you have to buy fewer permits, and therefore your costs go down, right? If you're a permit seller, 
for every unit that you reduce your emissions more, what happens? You're actually getting money. Your P is negative here. No, no, no. You're actually getting money, right? For every unit of emissions reduction that you do, you can sell more permits, and that means that your costs are falling, right? So also here, what you need to do is subtract minus P uh, MN, where P is the permit price. And the difference between this equation and this equation is that we replace the T with a P, right? But nothing has changed structurally. So with taxes, with subsidies, and with tradable permits, a rational company would reduce its emissions to the point where um, the marginal costs equal the tax or the subsidy or the price of the permit. And if the tax is uniform, everybody pays the same tax, or if the subsidy is uniform, everybody gets the same subsidy, or if the permit price is equal for everybody, that is, there's is no uh, market segmentation, then we automatically meet the cost effectiveness criteria, right? Okay, and it was Balmol who also should have won the Nobel Prize. Um, Balmol should have won the Nobel Prize for this, but also for a couple of other things. Um, anyway, I said I would skip all this uh, and instead use the last 22 minutes to talk about uh, market power and enforcement. First, gonna do uh, and talk not about market power, I'm gonna talk about price takers. Um, so let's assume um, a simple uh, demand and uh, supply, a simple uh, partial equilibrium model where uh, the quantity demanded is some sort of parameter pi uh, minus uh, the price. Pi is a parameter. Um, <laughs> So the greater the price, uh, the less we demand. Uh, pi is the choke price. Uh, if the price of the good equals pi, then we don't want anything, right? It's too expensive. Uh, if this is uh, the demand function and this is the uh, price function or the inverse demand function, right? Um, <coughs> so this is the consumer side and uh, the producer side uh, profits are a capital pi and the revenue uh, p times q minus the cost of producing uh, which is a half times q squared um, and then there is a tax in this market that is proportional to the amount of stuff that we bring on the market uh, that is equal to the tax times the quantity minus tau q Let's assume that there's no market power. Um, it is uh, the pi, the q, the point where we maximize our uh, profits um, is p, q, right? Two cancels against one half minus tau. And the crucial assumption in a price taker is, of course, that our price p this price P, does not depend on how much we put on the market, right? That's independent of our quantity. Um, so P minus Q minus tau must equal zero. So the amount we put on the market is uh, the price P uh, minus the tax uh, tau. <coughs> uh, and then we impose a Cournot equilibrium. We call the difference between Cournot and Bertrand. In Cournot we said that quantity equal to the quantity, the quantity supplied equal to the quantity demanded. In Bertrand, we said the price equal uh, on the supply and demand side, but this is a Cournot equilibrium, so P minus uh, Q, this is the inverse demand function, equals uh, the supply function, uh, pi minus tau, uh, which then has that the price uh, equals the choke price plus the tax divided by two and the optimal quantity or the equilibrium quantity, sorry, equals uh, pi, the choke price minus the tax over two, right? This is what would happen if you have a price taker. 
Now, here is the monopolist. Uh, now, properly, demand hasn't changed. Uh, the profit function hasn't changed either. But what has changed is that we now have a monopolist. And the difference between a monopolist and a price taker is that the monopolist can manipulate the price, right? Uh, <coughs> so in our first order condition for optimality, it's still d pi dq equals zero. That hasn't changed. But now we take into account that we can influence the price, right? Uh, so half q squared is still the first partial derivative is still q. Uh, tau q, the first partial derivative is still minus tau, right? That hasn't changed. Uh, but the first partial derivative of p times q to q has changed. Chain rule, uh, it's still p is here, but now we also have to include q times dp dq, right? By the chain rule. So a price taker sets this term to zero. A monopolist set this term to minus one. Right? Because the price elasticity here is 1. Yeah. Quinoa equilibrium, uh, quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. Uh, that's those two conditions here. Yes, uh, that's where the R comes from. Uh, <coughs> work this out, and now the quantity supplied is p minus tau divided by 3 rather than divided by 2. Right? There we go. So the difference between putting a tax, tau, in a perfect market and a monop monopolistic market is that there's a different response to prices, no surprise there, and therefore also a different response to the tax that we impose. Right? Now, let's introduce uh, a social planner. Uh, and the social planner uh, wants to maximize uh, social welfare, and one part of social welfare is the consumer surplus, uh, which is awkward, uh, because I only gave you a demand function. Uh, so we need to integrate over the demand function, um, which is this thing here. And if you work that out, blah de blah de blah, uh, you find that this is our uh, consumer surplus, right? This is an integration over a linear function, so it becomes quadratic, right? Um, <coughs> social welfare equals the consumer surplus plus the profit plus the government revenue, TQ, don't forget the government in your uh, welfare, minus the environmental damage, and we assume that the environmental damage is proportional to the quantity uh, of the stuff, and the marginal damage is given by the parameter delta. Plug in all these things, um, what actually happens is that your costs cancel against your costs, essentially just a transfer. Your taxes cancel against your taxes because that's another transfer payment, right? Uh, and what we're left with is that the consumer surplus really is the choke price minus the environmental damage, the externality, uh, times Q minus Q uh, squared. Um, and now we want to set the optimal tax, knowing that um, the so this is the social welfare. This is the best response function of the producer to the tax, right? This gives how much you put on the market as a function of the tax. So this is a response function, but it follows from an optimization. Uh, so it's the best response function. <coughs> so we can plug that in here. Um, so you wondered, you may have wondered, dW d tau, and whereas W is pi minus delta Q minus Q star, there's no tau there, right? Well, if you plug in the best response function, there is a tau there, right? Uh, so now we can do dW d tau. Um, uh, this is a linear thing, 
uh, so that is simply uh, pi minus uh, delta over 2 uh, this is a quadratic thing so the 2 goes in front uh, we have a 2 and a 2 so that nicely cancels and then we have pi minus tau uh, over 2 um, again must equal 0 so what we have is lo and behold that the optimal tax tau equals the marginal damage to the environment delta we have found pigou again right i found pigou a couple of times now i actually forget how many times we found pigou right now look at the monopolist social welfare function is the same but our best response function is different because a monopolist can manipulate the price the best response of a monopolist to a tax is different than the best response of a monopolist to um, is different between a monopolist and a price taker this is our welfare this is our uh, best response to the tax the w d tau procedure is still the same the difference is that instead of twos here we now have threes and our optimal tax is one and a half times the externality minus a half times the sale price so comparing uh, these two the optimal tax in a perfect market equals the marginal value of the externality but the optimal tax in a monopolist the externality is still there right it's still delta but now we have to contend with the choke price pi and we have to uh, we use a different slope right so what did I just say um, in a perfect market the pollution tax is the pigou tax the optimal tax is the pigou tax and that equals the marginal damage done by the pollution if in a monopoly if you apply the pigou tax output would be too low because the monopolist suppresses demand so you overshoot um, Why do I say you apply a lower tax? Ah, because your delta is typically lower than your pi. Um, <coughs> your delta must be lower than your pi, otherwise you just sh shut down the market. Um, so, in a uh, monopolistic market, in a monopoly, you apply a lower tax. And a lower tax that doesn't just reflect um, the externality but also your price elasticity and your choke price um, <clears throat> and that is because the tax that you now apply serves two functions one it reduces monopoly power and second it reduces the environmental externality right and this is a Tim Bergen problem, right? You have actually two issues in your economy. You have market power and you have an environmental externality, but you have one instrument only. It's a bit silly. You would like to have two instruments, right? First, you would like to curtail monopoly power, and then separately, you would like to solve your environmental problem. But if you don't have that ability, then you're solving two problems with one instrument, and you have to find a compromise between those two, right? Um, now this was a very simple uh, monopolistic si case of course we can make more complicated partial equilibrium models and you would find more complicated algebra of course I can introduce oligopolistic markets uh, oligopolies rather than monopolies that would just make the math more complicated but the fundamental insight remains the Pigou tax only applies in a perfect market if you have market power of any sort then you need to deviate 
from uh, Pigou. Um, <coughs> the mathematics gets hairy very quickly, um, which implies that there are lots and lots and lots of economic uh, papers on this because we like to solve uh, difficult math. Um, I have not seen any application. I can do enforcement, but only the theory part in the remaining five minutes, seven minutes. Um, <coughs> this is a simpler one. Notation looks a bit uh, more complicated to me because this is a call step uh, example. Um, and that has to do with monitoring and enforcement. What I have assumed so far is that people obey the law, that polluters, when a tax is implied or a target is set, uh, they just do this, right? Uh, which is a silly assumption, and those of you who have been following the news um, about uh, the raw sewage uh, ending up in waters, I told you, I think in week three that you should not swim um, in uh, the rivers of England uh, and that has now been brought home right and that is because water companies or uh, sewerage companies keep on dumping shit in the river right um, even though they are not allowed to right um, they still do it uh, so enforcement is an issue and enforcement is actually one of the bigger environmental issues in this particular country uh, <coughs> but so far I've ignored that um, so um, I'm going to slightly complicate the model um, and introduce um, this uh, aspect here. So C is the cost of emissions or the cost of emission reductions, right? This is the benefits of emissions. No, it's the cost of emissions. Um, F wasn't there before, F was zero before. F is the fine that is imposed if your emissions are too large. And F has the following structure. If you meet your target, then you won't get a fine. If you do not meet your target, if you dump raw sewage in the river, if you're not allowed, uh, then this happens. P pi is the chance of being caught and fines being imposed. And then the fine that is imposed is a D, which is a fixed fine, and a variable one that depends on how much higher your actual emissions are than what you were allowed to do, right? And these are just generic functions uh, at the moment. <coughs> and they actually will remain uh, generic functions. Um, and then uh, this looks something as follows. Um, if this is your cost curve for emissions, right, it goes to zero, this is the unregulated amount, and it goes up, and up, and up, and up, if you push your emissions down to zero. This is your standard S. This is what happens if you're caught and get a fine, and uh, then your cost function looks like this, and its minimum is here, right? It's the S bar. That is one situation. The other situation is when their fine is pretty lenient and then the C functions are the same but the F function is much lower so the sum total of these is actually uh, this thing here it's a jump here still this is your uh, fixed fine uh, but your optimum now lies here and you want to emit the amount uh, E Charlie puts it here I think it's a bit too far to the right but it's definitely greater than your S bar right uh, so this is what you would do if the fine is too low, right? In the first case, uh, the fine uh, was so high that the company complies with its standard. In the second case, the fine is not high enough for compliance. Um, <coughs> now, let's consider the second case, right, where it's actually optimal to uh, exceed the uh, standard. Uh, so that means that the cost function uh, is this, so the F function, the capital F, is no longer this uh, weird constellation, uh, but it's now uh, just the top condition. Um, the total costs are minimized where the T, C, the E equals zero, 
which means that the CDE, that is this thing here, this is wrong, um, plus uh, pi, the probability of being caught, uh, times f, and this should be a marginal, uh, sorry about that, uh, is equal to zero, um, where the and that implies that the marginal costs of emission reduction must equal pi times the marginal fine. Right? I sort of put the implicit assumption here that this is a linear function, uh, which I should not have done. So the marginal cost of emission reduction uh, equal the variable fine times the probability of being fined. Right? Uh, nothing particularly special here. And of course, the fixed fine is a fixed one, so that drops out of your marginal calculation. Now, <coughs> this thing should equal the marginal benefits. The marginal costs of emission reduction should equal the externality, the marginal benefits of emission reduction. Right? That is our condition for uh, our cost-benefit uh, condition, cost condition for optimality. So. Marginal cost of emission reduction should equal the marginal benefits of emission reduction. And the marginal costs also equal pi times f. So our fine f equals the marginal benefits, the externality, divided by the pi, the probability of being fined. So that is our optimality condition now, that instead of imposing a tax equal to the marginal benefits, we now impose a fine equal to the marginal benefits divided by the chance of being caught and convicted. Right? So if on average you catch 10% of water companies doing bad things, it's probably an accurate estimate, you do not want to charge them for the environmental damage that they do at the margin, but because you have only a 10% of catching them, you want to charge them 10 times the environmental damage that they do at the margin, right? That is what this means. That is what the pie does here. Of course, if there's a 100% chance of catching the bad guys, then your pie is one and nothing has changed, right? 